On a hot summer's day, Jinta Yadomi sits at home alone, hunched in front of his computer, blasting aliens as he curses the happy couples walking by outside. Glancing up from the game, he finds his fortress of solitude has been invaded by his childhood best friend Menma, who bothers him with inane questions about what he's playing. It's a scene right out of the start of any rom-com or dating sim with one small difference. Menma's been dead for five years, and in that time, Jinta and their four other best friends, known collectively as the Super Peace Busters, have drifted apart, each scarred by the trauma of loss in their own way, and each incapable of talking to the others about it. Which is a problem, because Menma has a wish that can only be granted by the five of them together. Jinta can't be sure whether she's a stress-induced hallucination or an actual ghost, but either way, he just can't say no to her. So this sad, angry Hikikomori has no choice but to get the gang back together in hopes that they'll finally be able to put the memory that's been haunting them for the last five years to rest. That compelling hook is how Anohi Mitahana no Bokutachi wa Mada Shiranai, or We Still Don't Remember the Name of the Flower We Saw That Day, begins. It ends like this. If you haven't seen Anohana already, you probably think that's just a very pretty, slightly sad J-pop song. If you have, you probably had to pause the video when it started and take a second to compose yourself, because that song, Secret Bass 10 Years After version, isn't a song at all. It's a weapon, an emotional bunker buster that, once you've been primed, has an uncanny ability to rip through your mental defenses like tissue paper and reduce you to tears in a matter of moments. If you're wondering whether you should watch Anohana, the answer's yes. Until Mob Psycho 100 went into its second season, this was my favorite anime of all time, and I'm about to spend 30 minutes gushing about all the things it does well and everything it's meant to me over the years, mostly just because I want to talk about how great it is. Right now, before all of that, though, I want you to capture in your mind how you first felt hearing that song, because I promise you, it won't be the same once you're done. I certainly wasn't the same after I first watched this anime. I've talked before about how Anohana showed me the value of catharsis in media, of having a good cry just to get the feelings out, something I used to do when I was a kid, but that I buried as the world told me to toughen up. This show really awakened my appetite for nonviolent, emotionally driven dramatic storytelling and jump started my evolution from Shonen Bro to the pretentious anime academic you all know and tolerate today. If I hadn't found this show when I did, my tastes in anime, and therefore this channel, would probably be very different than they are now. I don't know if I'd have ever watched Your Lie in April, Rakugo Shinju, Yorimoi, I'd almost certainly have viewed Erased differently, and I wouldn't have met my girlfriend if I hadn't made those specific videos when I did, so yeah, just by broadening my horizons, Anohana really changed my life for the better, and that's far from the only thing I owe this show. So unsurprising that it has such a place of prominence in my heart, but if you're on the fence about watching it, I don't want you thinking that my recommendation comes from a place of pure sentimentality. Yes, Anohana was the right anime for the right time in my life, but it's also one of the all-around best made anime I've ever seen, period. Even eight years later, re-watching it, having seen a much wider range of anime that I can now compare it to, I was still impressed by every aspect of its production. Nary a moment of its 11-episode runtime is wasted. You can't talk about Anohana without talking about its screenwriter, Mari Okada. She came up with the show's premise, and its teenage recluse protagonist, Jintan, was written by drawing on many of her own experiences as a depressed high school truant. But Anohana is not solely her story. It wouldn't be half the anime it is without Tatsuyuki Nagai's direction, Jin Akatagawa's sound design, Reimi Horikawa and Galileo Galilei's music, or the dozens of other talented artists who brought it to life. 
Likewise, this isn't just Jintan's story. Anohana has six protagonists, each of whom ranks among the richest, most complexly imagined characters in the anime canon. As we dive into those characters and the show's other merits, things are going to get progressively more spoilery from here, so if at any point you want to duck out and watch the show on Netflix, which is, to my knowledge, the only place where you can stream it in HD with the dub, it's a quick binge, and I'll be waiting here when you get back. It makes sense for us to start with Jintan, as he was the cheerful, confident leader of the Super Peace Busters. Emphasis on was. Losing Menma and his mother not long after that turned Jintan's already bad habit of hiding his feelings behind a brave face into a full-blown complex. When the weight of his frustration and sadness became too much, he shut down, dropped out of school, and went into hiding. When we first meet him, he's a sad, petty, openly misogynistic jerkass, raging at the world and his old friends for apparently changing and passing him by. He's even resentful of Menma when she first shows up, pushing her away, even though all he's ever wanted for the last five years is a chance to apologize to her. Her kind, mellow presence pushes him to stop being such a dick pretty quickly, though, and once he stops beating himself up, he's able to begin reconnecting with his old friends, our other heroes. There's Naruko Anjo, known by the unfortunate nickname Anaru, which... Yeah, she's not a fan of anymore now that she knows a little bit more English. A quiet, kindly girl who goes with the group to avoid inconveniencing others. She's had a crush on Jintan and as a result been jealous of Menma since she was a kid. And she hates herself for that, for resenting the dead girl who she also loved and admired. To deal with this, she tends to change her personality to fit in, which has made her popular, but also left her feeling insecure and lonely. Because of this, it's a bit difficult to get a bead on exactly who Anaru is, but at her core, she really cares and worries about all of her friends, and while she's not as honest as Menma, she's just as loving. Atsumu Matsuyuki, Yukiatsu, is also consumed with jealousy, though his is directed at Jintan. He too was in love with Menma, still is actually, and together with Anaru, he plotted to force Jintan and Menma to confront their feelings, right before she died. He is racked with guilt, unable to forget his feelings, and stuck feeling inferior to Jintan no matter how much he outshines the sad shut-in in academics and in life, because the one thing he wanted that Jintan had, Menma's love, is now forever outside his reach. In the daytime, this inferiority complex manifests as well, he's an asshole. At night, he deals with it in an even less healthy way, though. He's created this very distorted image of Menma in his head to contain his bottled up emotions and to punish him for his guilt, and sometimes he dresses up as her and runs around in the woods where she died at night. He is not well. The first to notice this proclivity is Chiriko Surumi, Suruko. Suruko is a bit of a wallflower, most comfortable quietly observing and sketching the people and places around her. She's good at picking up on things that the people she knows want to hide, and there's nobody she knows better than Yukiatsu because she's in love with him. Despite her feelings, though, Suruko doesn't have a jealous bone in her body. Not because she's better than that, but rather because she's convinced she's worse than it. She thinks she doesn't deserve to have her feelings returned. Her sense of self-worth is at rock bottom, and instead of honing her natural talent for art, which she doesn't appear to see any value in, she busts her ass to get good grades just so that she can stay in Yukiatsu and Menma's shadow. She can only get out of it by realizing that she is just as irreplaceable as Menma was, and great in her own way. The only one of the busters who doesn't butt heads with Jintan at first, and who immediately believes him about Menma's return, is Tetsudo Hisakawa. Popo, a shy, awkward young boy who, following Menma's death, grew into a free-spirited world traveler. While his friends were in school, Popo studied under monks in Thailand and India and learned to take things in stride. He's relaxed, approachable, fun, and funny, easily the most immediately likable and helpful of the Super Peace Busters. Popo's the kind of guy you just want to give a big hug. But first impressions can be deceiving. Popo is, by all accounts, a lovely 
lovely guy with an infectious smile, but Menma's death affected him and is still affecting him just as deeply as his friends, if not more so. Because Popo, this is the last episode, spoiler, so skip to here if you want to avoid that. Popo, he... Popo either watched Menma die, or he was the first to find her body, and he'll never know which because he was too scared to go help her. All he could do was watch the river take his best friend away, and now that's just about all he can see when he closes his eyes. So Popo ran away to see the world, to see new people, to see and learn about new things, to see anything other than that body and himself. All of the other busters are denying their own feelings to some extent, but none more than him. And he epitomizes the inherent contradiction of this coping mechanism, of forcing himself to forget. On the outside, he's the happiest and most well-adjusted of the group, but inside, he's racked with horrible pain that will never leave him because he won't and can't let it out. So, yeah, you really just want to give him a big hug. And by the end of this show, you'll want to do the same for all of the Super Peace Busters, even that jerk-ass Yukiatsu. Each of these characters is a mix of complicated, overlapping, sometimes conflicting emotions and desires. They all act according to their own consistent, complex internal logic, as do all of the supporting characters. It's remarkable just how much depth Mario Kata was able to create within this small cast in just 11 episodes. Anohana is impeccably written, as its full title hints, it can be downright poetic at times. But it's not just a great script, it's a full anime production. The performances in Anohana, both from the actors giving the characters their voices and the artists animating them, are nothing short of incredible, and these characters would be nothing without them. There's so much subtlety and nuance in how these characters move, where their eyes drift in conversation, the little ticks they have. And in both English and Japanese, every actor gives their all to bringing these wonderful characters to life. Mari Okada may have mapped out these complex inner worlds, but it's down to these actors to explore them, ultimately. And from their most passionate, expressive scenes, to the points where their voices break a little in discussing topics their characters would rather avoid, you can tell that both casts did a very thorough job of that. I've spent a lot of time talking about these characters because they give me a lot to talk about, and even with all I've said, I've only scratched the surface. But there's still one more Super Peace Buster left to discuss. We, of course, cannot forget about Menma. And while I'll get to her actual character in a bit, the nerd in me wants to talk first about how much I love the way her ghostly presence has been conceptualized and portrayed here. Anohana is a heavy melodrama, so you wouldn't necessarily expect it to spend a lot of thought on how to sell its fantasy elements, but it does, and it really shows. This is a shockingly naturalistic take on the supernatural. There are consistent, discernible rules to Menma's existence. She can't pass through walls or float, she's affected by gravity and physics just like everything else, and that means she can pick up and move objects around. Though she can only communicate using objects that she had a close connection to in life, namely her diary. These rules enable the story to develop along the emotional trajectory that it does organically without any of its problems or their solutions feeling forced or contrived. The series tries to only show us one version of its reality, the one where Menma is visible. When she's around people, people who can't see her, the show conveys their perspective by showing us extreme close-ups of whatever she's interacting with, omitting her hands from the frame, or by hiding her behind other people or objects in the shot. Rather than just showing us the thing she's holding floating in mid-air, the series prefers to sell the impression that they are through the reactions of those around her. At the same time, there are a few persistent visual clues that set her apart from the living cast, namely that she doesn't have a shadow or a reflection which, on a subconscious level, clues us in immediately that something is wrong when Yukiatsu shows up in his dress, even if we can't put our finger on it at first. Animation allows you to show literally anything that you can imagine, so I really love seeing anime restrain itself and intentionally use grounded filmmaking techniques like this. And that's far from the only example of great methodical cinematography in Anohana. The camera in this series is used very subjectively to help us get inside the headspace of 
of its characters and understand their relationships with one another, and pulls just as much weight in that regard as the animation or acting do. On top of Tatsuyuki Nagai, who handled the first and last episodes personally, Tomohiko Ito, Kenichi Imaizui, Fumie Muroi, Toshiya Shinohara, and Ai Yoshimura all brought their A-game to this show as episode directors, and they deserve credit for it. Anohana's emotionally driven directorial choices naturally do a great deal to enhance its emotional impact, but they serve a purpose beyond that, I think. We see most of the series specifically from Menma's perspective, and as she's a very kind, empathetic character, it only makes sense for the camera representing that perspective to make an effort to understand its subjects. All of the Super Peace Busters have, in one way or another, become trapped in the past as a result of Menma's accident, but none more so than Menma's Enma herself. Having never had the opportunity or impetus to grow up, she retains an impetuous, childlike personality even when she appears to Jintan in a teenage body. This childish attitude does create a few problems in the show, but it solves far more. Menma is described by Jintan as a crybaby, something he initially sees as a weakness, but as she shows with her response to his outburst on that day, that's a fundamental misreading of her character. It's not that she's oversensitive or emotionally unstable, but rather that she's honest and open with her feelings. She's capable of being so bright, cheery, goofy, and fun because she isn't afraid to cry when she feels like she needs to cry. She's also very empathetic and will often cry and smile for the sake of others. That honesty and capacity for empathy is a real strength, one Jintan sorely lacks at first, as we see when he literally runs away from his feelings on that day. The other super peace busters, whether they know it or not, draw on this strength of Menma's to be more honest with each other. This means that she's kind of the glue that held their group together and goes a long way to explain why they drifted apart after she died. Likewise, it makes sense that it's only because she brings that very immature strength with her when she comes back unchanged that her friends are able to mend their broken bonds. While the other Peace Busters have grown out of their childish nicknames along with their childish personalities, Menma is still Menma in all of their minds, and on the rare occasion when she's called Hanma Mako, usually by her mom or one of the Busters clinging to a pretense of maturity, it just feels wrong. Menma is Menma, the sweet, kind, innocent, playful girl they all remember, and any trait ascribed to her beyond that, like assumptions that she must be resentful following her death, is a projection made by the bereaved. Menma's mind was frozen in time when she died, but the thing that's kept her friends and family stuck in time is survivor's guilt. They all feel like they've done something wrong by living on when she's gone, that she must be mad at them for trying to continue living, mostly because they're mad at themselves themselves. And ironically, the only one who doesn't think this way is Menma. All she wants is to see her loved ones be okay without her, and while Quick spoilers, she begins to fade after fulfilling Jintan's mother's wish to make him cry, she only fully passes on once she's made sure that all of them will be. You know, the one thing that used to really bother me about Anohana is that it never gives us proper closure on Jintan and Anaru's relationship, along with other story threads, but watching it now, I actually really like that decision. By leaving those story threads dangling, the series is able to demonstrate that life for these characters will and has to go on that we have reason to hope for their future. There are parts of their stories that Menma will never see, and that's okay. Outside of the specific context of the story and her death, I think Menma represents a general state of being that is very good for one's mental health. She's retained the innocence, kindness, honesty, and optimism of a child with more adult intelligence, and holds fast to those ideals no matter how hard things get for her and her friends. That's not easy for her to do, and she almost loses faith in Jintan at one point when he starts hiding his part-time jobs from her, but her faith is restored when she sees him working so earnestly to fulfill her wish. And it is very worthwhile for her and for all of her friends to cling to that. Ultimately, Jintan and the rest of the Busters are only able to heal and help each other heal when they can find the Menma in themselves, reclaiming their own lost innocence and optimism by being honest with themselves and each other about their feelings, good and bad. 
their big collective breakdown at the shrine where all of their darkest secrets, all of the things they hate about themselves come pouring out, doesn't push them away from each other as they'd individually feared it would, but rather brings them together by tearing down the walls they'd built up between them and exposing their shared trauma. With those walls gone, their inner children can come out, which they all recognize by unconsciously reverting to their old nicknames. And with that perspective restored, they can all at last see clearly what they need to do for both each other and for Menma. They're also able to communicate those needs to each other, effectively make a plan, and trust each other to follow through on it, instead of pretending to work together while harboring doubts and scheming behind each other's backs like they do in the previous episodes. This healthy immaturity stands in stark contrast with the more toxic coping mechanisms we see the Busters and some of the adults around them employ earlier in the story. In trying to be stoic and contain their own feelings, they only end up hurting themselves and creating an atmosphere where nobody feels like they can really let their feelings out. The dangers of this mentality are embodied in Menma's parents. Her father pushes her family to forget and move on before they're ready, and her mom ends up trapped in a pit of of misery and anger for years as a result. It's only when they come out to see the fireworks together and start honestly talking about their feelings that they're able to start healing. Contrast that with Jintan's dad, a man who has embraced his inner child and isn't afraid to be emotionally open or get excited about cute things, who's willing to give Jintan the space he needs to figure things out because he knows enough to know that he doesn't know enough to magically fix his son's grief. His hands-off approach isn't perfect either, he does a lot more good for Jintan when he actually talks about things with him, but it's a heck of a lot better than trying to prescribe a set grieving period and force his kid to conform to his expectations. Anohana shows us how certain things that we're supposed to do as we grow up, namely developing a defensive response to the harsh realities of adulthood, can harden and harm us. It frames being emotionally vulnerable and reclaiming one's inner child, mainly through play, as an antidote to that harm. And that theme runs through the whole series from the beginning right up to the end, which I'm about to talk about in detail just to give you a spoiler warning. Jintan first sees Menma when he's lost in a childish video game, letting his immature side out, albeit in a very unhealthy way. The first time that the Peace Busters begin reconnecting and become open to the possibility that Menma's really back is when Jintan, Popo, and Anaru all sit down to play Nokemon together. And of course, everyone finally manages to see Menma only after they all join together in a game of hide and seek, where in their very last moments together, she sees them all as kids again. They were able to find Menma because they were able to find their own inner children, and because they were able to find their inner children, Menma can pass on knowing that they'll be alright, that she's given them the emotional tools they need to heal not just through this trauma, but any that might befall them in the future. The same goes, I think, for viewers who can internalize that lesson, and Anohana is very good at teaching you how to cry. I watched this show at a really rough time in my life. Nobody had died, but my world changed a lot in a short time and in a way that left me feeling numb and depressed. Looking back, sitting down to have a good cry with this show was one of the first steps that let me pull myself out of that and really let my feelings out. And I've heard similar stories from other fans who found the show in times of grief or depression. It may not be an Iashike anime, technically speaking, but Anohana has an incredible power to help people heal. Of course, the real tragedy of that final moment is that Menma fades away just seconds after her friends have finally found her, and boy does that get the waterworks going even when I'm just thinking about it. But while she passes on, I don't think she really left them, at least not so long as they're together. Because all of the Super Peace Busters are preserving bits and pieces of Menma within themselves, both in their memories of her and in their behavior. Sudoku keeps a hair clip that was meant for Menma and has grown out her own hair, despite preferring it short, in an effort to look more like her, or more like the version of her in Yukiatsu's head. As for Yukiatsu, well, that one's 
pretty obvious. Anaru, as a kid, tried to mold her entire personality after Menma, and has retained, among other things, her love of video games and her kind, supportive nature, even if she buries it under a bit of teenage bitchiness. Lastly, Popo is shown to be on the same goofy, playful wavelength as Menma, mirroring her joyous enthusiasm in many situations throughout the series, even when he can't see or hear her. Menma, likewise, has taken what she sees as the best aspects of the other Peace Busters into herself. She's gentle and kind like Sudoku, hardworking like Yukiatsu, funny like Popo, and though she wears her emotions on her sleeve, like Anaru, she's pretty good at keeping a level head. So, as they rediscover those buried parts of themselves, they end up reviving those parts of Menma, in a way. Because they loved each other, Menma and Jintan naturally ended up giving even more of themselves to each other than the others did. They're both confident, outspoken, and eager to help others, albeit in their own way. And Menma's last wish for Jintan was to help him learn to cry, to experience his feelings honestly instead of denying them the way that she could. A lesson that she ends up imparting to all of her friends before she goes. While Menma's ghost is no longer haunting the Super Peace Busters, her presence will be felt in the space between them and in their love for her and one another whenever they're together. Which, as they promised, they always will be. The Super Peace Busters are friends forever. I didn't even realize it until I rewatched it for this video, but that notion is probably the single most important thing that I personally have taken away from this show. Death is something that's always terrified me, and as an atheist for a long time, I never had an easy off valve for that existential horror. I know that I and all of my loved ones will just be gone one day, and within my understanding of reality, I just have no way of believing that I'll see them on the other side. What I can believe is that bits and pieces of them exist within me and our mutual friends and family, and that the inverse is true of everyone who knows me. So when we're together, the people who are no longer with us are not entirely gone. That idea is what's allowed me to come to terms with my own mortality. And incidentally, that does mean that from my point of view, by watching my videos and internalizing my ideas, you're all helping me kinda sorta cheat death, so thanks for that, suckers. Anyway, I digress. For years, I thought that that notion was something I came up with on my own, but looking back and rewatching this show, it is very obvious that it grew out of seeds that this anime planted in my mind many years ago. So in addition to breaking my emotional dam, opening me up to new kinds of storytelling and emotional experiences, and helping me eventually become a much happier person, Anohana helped me figure out one of the fundamental questions of my own existence. And I cannot not thank it or the wonderful artists who made it enough for that. That said, most of the anime that I hold up as my favorites today have helped to shape me in similar ways. Yorimoi, for instance, inspired me to be more adventurous, and Mob shot its way to the very top of my list by giving me a template for the kind of person I want to be, in addition to having incredible action and comedy and sad scenes and just being the best at everything that it tries to do. And that personal element is something I wish I'd touched on more in my video about why it's my new favorite. I spend a lot of my time on this channel analyzing and trying to interpret the meaning that artists intend or seem to intend to put into their work and the tools they use to convey that meaning. And by focusing so heavily on that, I think I sometimes lose sight of just how important personal experiences and interpretations are. Art is not a one-sided lecture, it's a conversation, one that the artist starts and that each member of their audience continues in in their own heads and with each other in their own ways. I can't say definitively if everything that I took away from Anohana, or any anime for that matter, is something that its creators intended to put into it, but even if it wasn't, that doesn't change the trains of thought that it sent me on, or the impact that it had on me and that it continues to have on me. Of course, the corollary to that is that Anohana won't necessarily have the same impact on you or anyone else who watches it. I know that it has for a lot of people, but I've also seen a lot of weebs who just don't like it, and if that's you, well, I hope that this video has at least helped you understand why it means so much to the many of us who do. 
Anohana is, in my opinion, one of the greatest coming-of-age stories ever told, and one of the greatest anime ever made. Beyond entertainment and catharsis, and to be clear, it offers plenty of both, it provides a healthy and effective framework for understanding and overcoming trauma of all times. A framework with the power, as I can personally testify, to change lives for the better. If you want to experience everything that anime has to offer, Anohana is absolutely essential viewing. Although, it will make it impossible for you to hear this song without crying. Let me know in the comments below what other essential anime you'd like to see me highlight in the future, and if you've seen Anohana, I'd of course love to hear your opinions on the series and your interpretations of its themes and ideas. Now, if you've already seen Anohana and are looking for another essential anime to watch, you're in luck, because Eleven Arts is screening a brand new dub of the Satoshi Kon classic Millennium Actress in select theaters across America on August 19th. Check the link in the doobly-doo for a showing near you. While you're down there, don't forget to hit subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to hear more of my thoughts on anime and other things every week. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, and if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go lie down and cry. <laughs>